And I am indeed honored to be here. Um, I am one of the lifetime members of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and very proud to be a part of that organization. Of course, Carter G. Woodson is a Virginian, born right here in Virginia, and I think it's so appropriate that he would start an organization to preserve the history that began right here in Virginia that changed the face of America. And to that end, I wanted to start by reading you just a short excerpt of an article that was written in 1970. It was published in Time Magazine. The author, Ralph Allison. The title of the article was, What America Would Be Like Without Blacks? The fantasy of an, of an America free of blacks is at least as old as the dream of creating a truly democratic society. While we are aware that there is something inescapably tragic about the cost of achieving our democratic ideals, we keep such tragic awareness segregated in the rear of our minds. We allow it to come to the fore only during moments of great national crisis. And he goes on to talk about this complicated history and the denials of that history by so many writers. But he ends with this. Our nation could not survive being deprived of their, meaning the presence of African Americans, because by the irony implicit in the dynamics of American democracy, they symbolize both its most stringent testing and the possibility of its greatest human freedom. And with that, I want to really begin my short presentation by talking about the forced arrival of approximately 32 people on the shores of Hampton, what was Kikitan, at a place that is called Old Point Comfort today, and what we call Fort Monroe. And I think it's so critical that we understand that when people at that time referred to that place as Jamestown, they weren't talking about what we call Jamestown today. Jamestown today is a specific, it has a specific zip code, but the Jamestown of the past was the whole colony that the English controlled. They called the fort, the fort. They called New Jamestown, that town outside of the fort, the town. And so it is difficult for 21st century people to understand the language of that time period unless you have the context. And so let me begin by saying that when I'm talking about the Jamestown colony, I'm not talking about Jamestown, which is located close to Williamsburg. And at that time, in 1619, we're also talking about the Virginia colony. And it was the first colony formed in blood by the English. The, the native peoples who lived here did not give up this land easily. And even in 1619, the colony was surrounded by a large and hostile population. And that population dwindled down over the centuries because of wars, because of contact with diseases that they had no defenses, and because of intermingling that went on both with the whites and with the blacks. But they never left, not really, because those who were in Kicktan, what we call downtown Hampton today, continue to live in that place. But the way we talk about that history has erased their presence. And the history of the real founding of America has also been erased. And so I hope that these efforts will help to change our national narrative so that we can start talking about what actually happened. And so what did actually happen in those early months and years? 
Well, we know that there, was, that there have always been wars, and there was a war going on in Europe called the Thirty Years' War. It was a war of power and empire. And we know there were wars going on on the African continent in very different places, and these were wars also for empire. And when the, the Portuguese set up with the cooperation of African chiefs in the area we call Angola today, they wanted to use those power dynamics to infiltrate in. And they also used groups of mercenaries to assist them in their efforts of conquest. And they were able, in 1619, to go into the kingdom of Ndonga, and they captured hundreds of people who were free, who were living in the cities and towns of that kingdom. Because you know, we have a tendency of still in this country describing Africa as first a country, when it's the second largest continent on the planet. And secondly, we have a tendency of homogenizing Africans as if they're all from the same group of people, the same culture, they speak. They don't, they're not the same. And so I, I'm, I'm making a point because I think it's time we move away from those homogenized terms that were used by Europeans in general, the English in particular, to dehumanize those people who were forced to come here and who began in 1619 and kept moving forward. These individuals were captured and taken to the fort, the, the port of exit called Luanda. And they were placed aboard a ship called the San Juan Bautista. And that ship was set sail for the Veracruz port, Mexico. And you know, for years, Mexico denied that there were ever any Africans in Mexico. And all you have to do is go to Mexico and look at the people to see Africans have been here. And they left their mark on everyone's face. Because it is not possible that thousands of people, you know, America, the United States only got 10% of the millions who were transported through the transatlantic slave trade. We only got 10%. So there were millions who were shipped to Mexico, to Central, South America, and the Caribbean. And these people were set to be part of that slave trade. They had not yet arrived. And that ship was beset with a lot of illness, so much so that they offloaded a number of people in Jamaica and continued on. And those individuals, that ship was then attacked off the coast of Veracruz by two ships. One, the White Lion, captained by a former minister. The second ship was the treasurer owned by the Virginia Company of London that started the Jamestown colony. They were pirate ships. However, they had a mark, meaning they had the authority of other countries who were at war with Spain and Portugal. And so that was England's covering to allow for piracy. And about 100 people were taken off of those ships and they set sail for the Virginia coast. So these people, were kidnapped twice. Not once, twice. And then they were taken to Old Point Comfort. Why there? Because that's the piece of land that juts out. It's, it, it was the place where the English wanted all ships coming in to first dock because they did not want people to see where the Jamestown Fort was located. And so they were they, there while they were there, many were sold to all of the heads of the colony. So the governor got some. The, the, uh, even the minister of the colony got some. The captains got some. And these individuals were scattered throughout the James River area. And there were some also placed in Kikatan. They were human beings. And in late August, the white line arrived first. Storms probably separated the two ships. Three or four days later, 
the treasurer arrived. And those individuals were placed around in Virginia, along the James River, that included at the bottom what we call the Hampton Roads, which is where Hampton is located. And if we understand that these people, there were about 17 men and 15, excuse me, 17 women and 15 men, we don't know how young or how old they were. It seems from the records that many were rather young, teenagers. Can you imagine forced to leave your home? You were free and you were kidnapped and forced into bondage. And I say bondage specifically because I know some people refer to them as enslaved people. And I'm not one of those people. And it's because I'm not convinced that the English in this colony had fully established a system of slavery in 1619. There are too many incidences in which it does not seem to be the case, but we do know England had two forms of servitude in the colony. The first form was indentured servitude, and that's a servitude that had a contract with it, and you served anywhere from two to 10 years. Then there was another one, and it was called simply servitude. There were some people in England who were kidnapped into slavery, and excuse me, kidnapped and brought here as servants. And they were forced to serve sometimes up to 20 years because 20 years was considered lifetime servitude. And if you look at the records, those first Africans who were brought here, they were always referred to in the records as servants. But the thing that concerns me the most and lets me know that they were never treated the same is that they were never given names. Their names were not recorded for the most part. Not even their gender, not even their ethnicity, all the things that designate you as a human being with a past was erased from the records. And it is our journey that we are taking now as historians are uncovering the true history of these people, Linda Haywood and John Thornton, for example, made sure that we knew that these were Kimbundu-speaking peoples, that they came from the kingdom of Ndongo, so that we understand their culture, their religious ideas and practices, and we understand some of the remnants that we see today that started with them, so that we have a better understanding of who we really are. And if you are a Virginian, and you've been, especially in the Hampton Roads area for a long time, I encourage you to get a DNA test. And I'm going to tell you what I think you're going to find. You're going to find that you have West Central and Cameroon African background in your ancestry. And what that says is your family probably started right here as a family group, as African Americans in the 17th century, any time between 1619 and 1670. And what that helps you to understand is the pathway of your family. So what did these Africans bring to the table? They brought a culture. They brought a religion. They brought culinary practices. They brought architectural skills. They brought uh, welding, not welding, excuse me, blacksmithing. They brought uh, the ability to carve gold as well as iron. They brought technology with them. Why? Because these were skilled artisans. Many of them had an understanding of even Christianity. Many had already converted to Christianity in a syncretic way, the same way that Christianity is syncretic. Because Christianity, you know, is not pure anything. It comes from Judaism. And depending upon where Christianity is brought depends on what you integrate into that, into that belief system. And many of you here are actually practitioners of a syncretic religious idea because when, for example, you have certain kinds of superstitions, those superstitions are remnants of an older religion that you have continued to practice in your family. And these first Africans introduce not just the, the, the each other to those practices, but they introduced the English to those practices. They introduced the native peoples to those practices. 
And what we have today is the foundation of American society. But most importantly, these individuals who arrived, they fought for their freedom. They were the ones filing freedom suits. They were the ones like John Punch running away and trying to achieve his freedom with his feet, as Frederick Douglass did who claimed he stole his hands, his feet, his entire body, because he was a man. And so these individuals established even the definition of what freedom really means in this society. And as we move into the 19th century with the Civil War, they would also establish another important element of our understanding of freedom and democracy, and that's civil liberties. Because civil liberties without African Americans would not be the same. Because when you talk about race, you talk about color, you talk about orientation and so forth, you're talking about African Americans, and I'm not talking about sexual orientation, I'm talking about your cultural orientation. And so understanding this early history, I think is critical to our understanding of how our American narrative must include this story if we are to be honest with ourselves and to move into the 21st century as the United States of America. Thank you.